All right. Yeah, so I am happy to introduce uh, both Richard Anderson and Justin Williams, both uh, in the quantitative analytics department. Uh, this is going to be uh, for the LA Dodgers. This is a pretty cool uh, I think seminar. It's very different. It's, on, it's out of the left field from what we're normally used to. No so I'm very. <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> um, as I am uh, excited to kind of see how we can use you know, statistical analysis, uh, you know, in the perspective of baseball. Justin and I went to grad school together um, and we're both in the biostat department at UCLA. Um, and so that's why I know Justin pretty well. We were also apartment mates for a year, um, but it's cool. Again, you know, Justin's a biostatistician who went into working in the field of baseball. So it's really excited to sort of hear both Richard and Justin's experience and kind of learn more about uh, statistical analysis in the baseball front office. So I'll leave it to you guys. Thanks. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm going to take the early part of the talk. I'm Richard, by the way. Um, so today, uh, we're actually only going to do one section on the history of baseball statistics. But uh, yeah, we'll start with introductions. We'll talk a little bit about how, how statistics have been used in baseball. Um, it's kind of an interesting story of a bunch of like, hobbyist weirdos who got into it. There's, there's some uh, academic history to it. Um, we're going to talk about how uh, uh, statistics have evolved in baseball with the explosion of new data sources. Uh, and Justin's going to go through a case study on how we would handle something like evaluating defense in baseball. Um, so my background is I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Washington, the Pac-12 leading University of Washington in political science. Uh, I then went and did my PhD at the University of Michigan in political science. Uh, I, I went into grad school thinking I was going to be an academic, and, and that didn't work, and so I went into baseball instead. Uh, my first job out of grad school was I went to work for the Los Angeles Angels. Uh, I spent a year as director of analytics for the Cincinnati Reds, left baseball for a season, and for about a year now, I've been the uh, director of quantitative analysis for the Dodgers. And then a little bit on my background, I went to Boston College in undergrad with a pure math uh, major and then both an MS and PhD in biostatistics at UCLA. I was told we're not supposed to say UCLA this week <laughs> in the game, but we'll say it. Uh, and then I directly joined the Dodgers right out of grad school, first starting as a quantitative analyst and then now as a senior quantitative analyst. And I joined at a very good time. As you can see in this picture, uh, we won the World Series in 2020 right after I joined. Uh, and I was able to receive a ring. And this is uh, some of the R&D staffers at that time with our, our World Series ring. So that was a very cool day. Yeah. I wasn't there, <laughs> but I assume it was what sounds cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so what, what do people like us do in a baseball front office? Um, we build models and perform ad hoc analyses to, to assist with various tasks. Uh, I would say we have kind of three main areas that we focus on. The first is player evaluation and procurement. So this is uh, taking data, trying to quantify some skill, some way in which a player adds value on the field, uh, and then using that uh, ultimately in, in some sort of forecasting system, right? We want to be able to say, here's how good a player is going to be here, are all the ways that this player is going to add value uh, today, a year from now, five years from now. And that's meant to assist in things like signing players to contracts or making trades so that we know what we're, we can place a, a more precise value on say what we're giving up or what we're getting. Uh, we work in player development and training. So this is more direct intervention with players and coaches. Uh, so we might answer a question like, is Bobby Miller's fastball better than it was this time last year? So we're providing metrics to help players understand uh, if they're getting better at things or how we might be able to improve them. Uh, say, take a fastball like Bobby Miller's, we might go to coaches and say, we think if we change the, the way that this pitch moves, we might be able to get more out of it. Like, so we have that kind of back and forth with, uh, with our minor league training staff. Um, and then the third area, is, and I think this is probably what we're best known for, is on-field strategy. So this is like I would say the two primary questions are uh, fielder positioning. So given a batter and the pitcher, how do we want to position our fielders to give us the best chance of actually fielding that ball? So when you think about this in, in predictive modeling terms, it is we are trying to predict the trajectory of the ball, and then we are trying to optimize for where we think the ball is going to go. Um, 
The other area would be uh, matchups. So like, who do we want in to, to face a specific batter, right? We're going against Juan Soto or we're going against Bryce Harper. It's the seventh inning of a game. Which pitcher do we want in the game? All right, so we our models help inform those kinds of decisions to varying degrees. All matchups against Soto are bad. But there are degrees of bad. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit of background about how a baseball front office is laid out and again where we sit in it. Um, at the top here is what we would call our leadership group. So this is the president of baseball operations, the general manager. These are the people who make the big decisions about like, which players are we going to trade for, which, which contracts are we going to sign. Um, so yeah, Andrew Friedman is at the top of that, writing Gomes. Um, within baseball operations, it kind of splits into three main groups. Um, so there's the scouting group, which is broken into international. These are people who go scout the Caribbean. They're generally watching kids who are anywhere between 12 and 15 years old and trying to decide if we should hand them $5 million, even though they just hit puberty. Uh, I was just on a trip to the Dominican Republic, and the, the work that they're asked to do is insane. Like watching a 13-year-old play baseball and trying to decide if they're going to be good at 25 is incredibly hard. Uh, there's pro scouting. These are people who watch uh, players once they've like, been drafted, they're in a minor league system or playing for a major league team. And then there's amateur scouting, and that's an area Justin's very familiar with. This is our scouting of college and high school players who we acquire in the draft. Uh, player development this is our minor league coaching staff. This is how we you know, train players, how we turn minor league players into major league players. Uh, and then we sit inside of research and development. So there's four main groups. Uh, the first is baseball strategy and information. These are people who work directly with our coaches to help implement information uh, like from the models that we built. So right, we would build a fielder positioning recommendation model and they work with the coaches to make sure the coaches are comfortable with it. They know how to implement it. They are dealing with any ad hoc questions that come up. Uh, there's quantitative analysis and in in tech terms, we would be considered the core data science team. Um, then there's baseball systems. They do all of our data engineering. They build uh, the front end web applications. We've got a, a pretty nice website where anyone in the organization can access statistics, video, any kind of data that we have, any information we have, uh, and they can do it very quickly. And they can do a lot of cool ad hoc work in that, uh, in that environment. Uh, and then performance science. And this is, um, this is a group of Kind of quantitatively minded people who work very closely with player development. They're generally coming from more of a kinesiology, um, physics kind of background, and they're just experts in human movement. Um, I always say like we need them because those of us in quantitative analysis, we come from backgrounds of uh, working with tabular data. Um, and uh, we assume at least the data is, is somewhat nicely behaved and we don't know anything about how humans move. <laughs> Uh, and it turns out when you're when you're dealing with biomechanical data, when you're this very high frame rate data of how all the pitchers' limbs are moving, uh, if you just plug that into a predictive model, you're going to get some pretty wacky results. So we have the, the human movement experts with us as well. Um, I, I'm going to use we're going to use a lot of jargon in this yeah. talk, so I, I okay. thought we would just give a quick baseball refresher. Um, so a team's offense is a series of independent batter and runners. So one batter comes to the plate, they either make an out or they get on base. Uh, each uh, batter runner starts at home plate. Um, if you, you, know, you can get on base and then your, your turn batting ends when three players have failed. <laughs> Um, so baseball statistics go back to the mid 1800s. Um, so this is an example of an early box score. That this is not the first box score that was uh, published in 1861, but this is from you know, 1876. Um, if you're familiar with baseball box scores, you will see that this bears little resemblance to what we have today. But um, the purpose of keeping statistics was really to uh, communicate what happened in a game to a to a newspaper audience, right? You couldn't watch games, but you wanted some idea of what happened. So you might want to know how many uh, how many putouts were made, how many fielding assists were made, uh, how many hits there were. Um, so you know, early baseball statistics were really just developed by baseball writers for the, the purpose of kind of, uh, yeah, telling you what happened in the game. Uh, another thing you'll notice here is that um, 
by any like modern standard, this would be absolutely unwatchable. Uh, this is the the errors column here, like one team making thirteen errors, like that would be uh, that would be unacceptable in a junior high baseball game. Uh, so these guys were they were bad at baseball. Um, so. What what happened was a lot of these uh, these statistics that were developed by people working for newspapers. It became the sort of language of baseball. Right, to be a baseball fan is to a certain extent to interact with data. Right, if you are a baseball fan of a, a certain type, like you know how many home runs Hank Aaron hit or Babe Ruth hit. You know the Roger Maris hit sixty one home runs or that uh, Ted Williams hit four oh six. You know, it's, it's just like part of the language of baseball is this kind of uh, statistical record. You know? Um, and like I said, these were designed to describe what happened in the game, to, to communicate to an audience who couldn't see it. Um, and over time, they just started to be used to predict performance. Um, you know, these, these kind of classical statistics, uh, the problem is they, um, they oftentimes confound, like say, what one player contributes to an outcome. So the classic case would be, uh, RBIs is to run batted in. That's when a batter gets a hit and uh, someone comes in to score. And of course, someone has to be on base to come in and score for you to get an RBI, right? So uh, RB, you know, we we evaluated players for a long time on how many yeah. RBIs they had, and, and I think it was going to move away from things that are really dependent yeah. on teammates. Um, there was some. Some you know, mostly academic research that pushed against classical baseball statistics. So there's this uh, article from uh, 1963 in operations research, which again, this is just a, a hobbyist who collected a bunch of data from box scores. Uh, and the findings from this are actually still extremely relevant. It's uh, the article that, that established the idea of baseball as sort of a Markov process where you've got this series of discrete events where you can come up with an expectation of say how many runs are going to be scored or the probability that a team is going to win. And we still use it today. Uh, but everyone ignored it. <laughs> um, so baseball analytics was, was very niche. You know, it's uh, there's the story of Moneyball, that's the, the 2002 A's. That's the, the famous First, I don't know if it's the first example of people using statistical analysis inside of a baseball front office, but it's it's the most popular. There's a movie about it. You can watch it. It's pretty good. Um, teams started expanding in the early 2000s after seeing the success that Oakland was having uh, on a very small payroll, like replacing these, these very high, uh, high performing players and, and maintaining a consistent level of performance. Uh, and of course, that created a market for new sources of data. Um, people said teams are interested in using this data. Well, let's figure out how we can provide even more of it. Um, so it's 2006 uh, where we first get pitch tracking data. So before 2006, you would get, say, the result of a plate appearance. You would know if it was a home run or a single or a strikeout. Uh, when we started getting pitch tracking data, we got this uh, we started getting readings on how the pitch was moving as it leaves the pitcher's hand. So we get a full reading of the trajectory of the ball as it leaves the pitcher's hand. We know the full flight that the ball, or we know the, the full path that the ball took from leaving the pitcher's hand to arriving at home plate. That lets us describe things in, um, in much more precise terms than we used to be able to. Instead of saying a curveball looks like it has that shape, you know, an up-down curveball, we can describe it very precisely in terms of exactly how much it's moving horizontally and vertically. Uh, it's for the first time we're actually able to, to measure the value of an individual pitch because we never had pitch level data. Uh, and this has been hugely important in, in the training of pitchers in, in uh, certain pitches that have come in and out of favor in baseball in the past 20 years. It's, it's all because this data was made available. It's a classic story of, uh, it's all about the data you have. Like we're all, like we can throw whatever model we want at it and most, it's mostly the same thing. It's just, we got, we got better at our jobs when our data got a lot better. Um, and when I say we, I mean, I was 24. Um, so 2015 is the first time we get, um, we get bad at ball tracking. So now we can track the ball as it leaves the bat. So instead of describing things just in terms of this was a home run, this was a single, you could say this is how hard the ball came off the bat. This is the, the horizontal direction. This is the vertical direction. 
And that helped us um, do a lot of fundamental research into hitting. And um, it, it helps deal with things like the fact that every baseball stadium is different, right? A home run in one park is very different from a home run in another park. And that uh, this, this helped us deal with that. Um, and also in 2015, a different system, we started getting on-field player tracking. Um, so we get these kinds of readouts, these, these dots, these points. Uh, of 300 times a second, every player on the field where they're located. Uh, this helped crack the study of defense. So it turns out when you want to know if a player made a good defensive play, it's very important to know where they started, right? How far they had to go. And so we really only good, you know, in the past like eight to 10 years. Um, and then the modern, the, the bleeding edge is kinematic data. So now we are getting, um, for every pitcher and every batter, we're tracking roughly 30 points on their body 300 times a second as they're pitching or as they're hitting. And that allows us to say very precise things about mechanics for the first time ever. And I think the Dodgers have been uh, more effective than most teams at, at leveraging this data to say, um, this pitcher has some mechanical inefficiency. We think he can throw harder if he does X. I think uh, if you look at the performance of our organization, we've done very well getting people to throw harder just by cleaning up their mechanics. And that would be, uh, un we, we wouldn't be able to do that without this data. Um, so common challenges uh, in baseball data. Uh, first, our data are, are very not IID, right? We are, we are observing the, the same players, the same batters, the same pitchers in the same stadiums uh, over the course of several years. Uh, we have to model all of those dependencies and figure out how to deal with that. Our data is not IID. We can't just chuck it in a neural net and, and say, okay, great. We love what comes out of it. Um, our data gets collected in a lot of different formats. Like a lot of these go back to before there were modern data collection systems, but we get uh, scout grades, right? Scouts put numbers on players' skills, and that's data. I mean, it's often it's often um, it's often portrayed as scouts versus analytics people, but I think of scouts as providing just valuable sources of information that we can also build into models. Um, we get a lot of rankings. We get all the, the kind of data that I talked about before. We get text. We're trying to figure out how to use all of this because uh, it's it's there to be used. Um, the other thing is that uh, well, uh, this point is just an overly complex way of saying that like, I, I think we need to be really good about quantifying our uncertainty because when you think about like what we care about with a minor league baseball player, we care about the tail outcome, right? We care about all we care about all the worlds where they become a successful major league player and all the worlds where they never you know rise above the lowest levels of the minor leagues are all roughly equally valuable to us so we care a lot about quantifying our uncertainty um and then the last thing is we have a lot more data than we know what to do with we quickly get to terabytes of data when we're working with all this kinematic data and um, even just the play-by-player -play the pitch-by-pitch -pitch data we're having to get creative and, and come up with solutions to to build models that can provide predictions in, in something close to real time uh, when we don't we can't just set it off and say we'll see the results in six months can i ask a question yeah please exploding the data that you got over the last five to ten years like on, on the google <laughs> cell and looking at there is that based on like video image analysis or like wearable sensors or it, it's, it's based on radar data that's a good question so if you actually know where to look in a baseball stadium you'll see all of these cameras uh set up to again to kind of uh figure out where the pit where the ball is at any given time and how it's moving really? um so yeah they're they're pretty nondescript but it's all radar data and they, in fact, changed the vendors of the radar data, and that was a big change that we had to like deal with. Like, if someone's capturing data in a different way, it's supposed yeah. to be the same, but in theory, it actually wasn't. Yeah, we also run into data quality varies a lot because it turns out when you um, when you take this elaborate camera system that was developed to uh, that was optimized for use in in Dodger Stadium, you know, where we can get fifty five thousand people in, and you try and install that same system at, in a backfield in the Dominican Republic where say like, oh, there's a light pole back there that we can hang a camera to, uh, the, the quality of the data varies a lot. 
Yeah, so given the like, amounts and extent of data that we have, we have a lot of different types of models that we'll use in our, our tool belt as any good data scientist or biostatistician or, or anyone would use. Um, I, I list off a few here from anything from simple linear regressions to mixed effect models, time series models, if you're trying to evaluate player talent over time, there's spatial components to how players move in the field to interact with each other. We can use computer vision to generate our own data, assuming that we have broadcast video coming in. Um, there's economic price modeling, trying to understand how valuable is a player as an asset to us versus another team. Um, NLP, like anything that you probably are interested in, there's probably a baseball analytics uh, niche that's trying to solve that problem, which is very fun and exciting and at times overwhelming. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little more about one specific case study here. Um, it's going to be focused on fielding evaluation. And I have uh, an example video because we have uh, some videos which may or may not play. <laughs> okay, there'll be no video. Um, the the video is essentially is a, a ball hit. It's a left center field, and there's two fielders that are trying to catch it. Um, and the center fielder, the left fielder comes over and cuts off the center fielder and, and makes the play. Uh, I'll come back to this example later, and we'll have some non-video data that shows where it is. So essentially, we want to be able to define on, on any play, any ball in play, how difficult was the play, um, how do we assign credit or debit? Like who should be in charge of receiving that um, given the fielders that were on uh, available in the play? And how do we define like what is the optimal location? Going back to what Richard said, on-field strategy. If I know, if I had known a priori where the ball would go, where would have I positioned fielders to most likely catch the, the balls? And then how do we wrap that up into fielder talent? And how does fielder talent age or change with throughout time? So this has been a, an interesting problem. Uh, historically, doing evaluation was uh, thought of in terms of three main stats, putouts, assists, and errors. Um, these were very simple. Like if you made the play, if you were able to touch the, the ball with your glove, you would have a chance at making a putout, assist, or an error. And the conventional wisdom was that fielders who made fewer errors, fewer mistakes, were, were better, uh, which created this simple definition of what uh, you often see cited sometimes on baseball games still, fielding percentage, which is the number of putouts and assists you had over the number of putouts, assists, and errors. The main problem with this is that it doesn't actually account for your ability to reach the ball. Uh, so we know that certain players are able to reach more balls and therefore have more potential for making more errors than a similar player. So the player A may be penalized more for getting the ball, um, but not converting the out compared to a slower player, player B, who never reaches the ball. Uh, there's a really good overview of this debate that's centered around the defensive ability of Derek Jeter um, by Ben Lindbergh. Um, and it turns out he wasn't actually as good with fielder as people traditionally think, and all his throwing, his air throws are probably unneeded for, for most fielders. <laughs> um, so then if we think about how the data has evolved, we started to get a few more advanced uh, or enhanced fielding metrics. There was some new data available from Baseball Invol Solutions. So this company was in charge of manually charting plays. So they would look at a play and they would try to identify uh, from video and then chart on a coordinate axis where the player was, where the ball went at the time of, uh, of it being put in play. And then you can do things like uh, bucketing similar types of plays. This is more like categorical uh, discretization of the entire space into kind of like similar types of plays. And they use this to assign debits and credits uh, relative to some expectation. Uh, two then popular public uh, advanced fielding metrics emerged. These were ultimate zone rating and defensive run saved. They both were translating this fielding performance to runs, uh, which is a really big step as well because having things on a run scale allows it to compare with other metrics. So if you know how many runs you can contribute batting and fielding, you can potentially add those together and be like, what's the total run value of this player overall? Um, makes it much easier to combine information. It still had some major challenges in that it relied on this manual charting and often some subjective grading by video scouts. So they had information about where the play was, did he move to his left or the right? And then there would be like a grade of how difficult the play was, like impossible, hard, uh, easy. And uh, it was a subjective determination that someone was making. Um, so it's, it's limited in that sense. Um, so we can think about this in terms of like a general modeling, modeling structure. Um, it's a pretty simple model at, at its base. All we have is an outcome. We want to know whether an out was made or not. Um, and we have some set of features. We can think of in terms of a ball that's hit into the outfield. We have things like 
the hang time. We have the distance that the runner needs to, the feeder needs to move. We have potentially better speed, uh, which we may or may not think is important for an outfield model. Um, but we essentially want to be able to then construct a metric, uh, a predictive model to estimate the probability of the out made given this set of features. So again, like I said, there's a bunch of different modeling choices. You would ideally start simple and then add complexity, add features, add predictive things that you think will make it easier to interpret. Like we're delivering these to coaches and to executives. And so there is some benefit to having a model that's simpler and interpretable. Um, but you can, you can throw the kitchen sink at it if you really want. Um, and this is what the data would, would look like at, at a certain level. So this is actually the fielder locations using the tracking data for all starting locations for fielders in 2021. Um, and it's split by the handiness of the batter. So righty versus lefty. Um, there's some interesting trends you can kind of see uh, happening here. So for yeah. left-handed batters, you'll see this purple one uh, around second base is extended out into the outfield. Um, does anyone have a, a guess for why that might be? Yeah, the shift, exactly. So left-handed batters are more likely if they hit the ball on the ground to hit it to the pull side, which would be where that, that line is. And so what has traditionally been done as we built these models was to shift additional fielders over there to cover more ground on that side and give up more ground on the other side where they're less likely to be. You can see similar trends in the outfield where players are moving, center fielder usually stands right in the middle, the, the shade to one side or the other. Uh, the shift actually is no longer allowed in this form. Uh, there has to be now two fielders on each side of the infield, which is a new fun problem that they introduced to us. Well, we got two good in our jobs. Yeah. They, just, they, had to yeah. Curve most. they were upset we were making all the conversions. To yeah. the <laughs> they want to see more hits, more action. All right. And then this video doesn't work, but we'll. Uh, I'll give you some details about the play and then I'll show a, a static image of it. So we know that the ball was in the air for approximately 4.8 seconds. Uh, there, there's the actual image. This is what happened on the play in static form. So there's two starting fielders here, the green and the, the blue, and they both converge towards this red X, which is where the ball landed. And the blue player, the left fielder, uh, in this case, made the out. They're both luckily about the same distance away, um, 97 and 96 feet respectively. They were going towards the wall. Um, distance from the walls is potentially an important feature as well. They were about 12.6 feet. And using our model or a model that was built, we have that the left fielder uh, had an out probability on this play of approximately 52. So the, a coin flip play almost. And the center fielder actually had an out probability that was nearly 25% uh, higher, 66, 76%. So another fun pop quiz. So, if we assume that the distance from these two fielders is, is roughly the same, why would our model estimate that a center fielder has a higher out probability than a left fielder um, in this case? Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely uh, a component. The center fielders are typically the faster outfielders than corner outfielders, and they also have priority. They get to call off the other corner outfielders, so balls that are more in between are typically more often caught by center fielders than corner outfielders. So that's Exactly right. Uh, there's a there's a question online. Yeah, actually, uh, it, it, it's actually an answer. Handedness. Most players are right-handed, so the center fielder is going to be leading with his glove hand, and if the left fielder is also right-handed, he'd be lead, leading going the other way. Yeah, that definitely also contributes as well. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, so this is kind of like the, the challenge that we are given as our department, as, as analysts, is trying to build these models and then evaluate how successful are they, how well calibrated, uh, and use them to impact on field decision, decisions. Um, so like I said, how can we optimally arrange the collection of fielders to prevent offense? So this is like a picture I took of this twins outfielder, Max Kepler. He's checking in a positioning card. So on that card would be outputs of given every batter pitcher combination, where am I supposed to see him? Um, it probably isn't as specific numerically. It's often kind of like shade this way or that way or in or out. X um, amount of steps. Yeah. Something, something that's interpretable to your average baseball player or coach. So the question of this, the previous model yeah. and the probability of making it out, mm -hmm. like just as a rough idea, how many features are in there in terms of you have lots of data points, you know, where they are, all these things, distance, 
handedness, other things. How complex is this model and the interpretability and, and things like that? Like and and balancing that as well, right? <laughs> There's a some number. Of, I, I don't want to get like yeah. <laughs> too specific about like how like the this is going out on the internet after all. Yeah, yeah this, this is, is a very yeah. popular YouTube I've, page. Just that. roughly, because you have, I mean, you've given the the impression right. You have lots of information. Yeah, over a hundred types of things, right? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you want a model that's predictive, but also interpretable yep. to some extent. So you can go to a coach and say. Do this, do that when you know real time decisions need to be made. Yeah, and we'll have kind of different versions of models. We can have ones that are maybe more complex that maybe have slightly better predictive accuracy than simpler models, and there may be models that have uh, a smaller <laughs> set of variables that we've learned are typically most important overall. Um, and then we can kind of go to like leadership and be like, this is the difference between complexity and interpretability. Are you comfortable with understanding less if I can show you uh, quantitatively that this model is outperforming X percentage than like a baseline interpretable model? Um, and they're also kind of like regular being tweaks. New information's coming in, right? We talked about like each year there's kind of different vendor information as well. Um, so it's a good way for me. I'm just going to dance around yeah, how I, many features have been. I, I mean, I, I don't think yeah. we need to be. I, I would say this is a problem, though, where <laughs> if you imagine in your head, what is a difficult play look like in the outfield? Mm -hmm. It's primarily how far did the fielder have to go? Uh, how much time did they have to get there? What direction were they going? Like, you know, it's harder to run back and like, track the ball over your shoulder than it is to come in. Um, and then like if you're about to run into the wall and you're worried for your physical safety, um then then it makes the play harder it everything else is sort of window dressing after that and like you can't we we do have additional features in there but the i don't know if i were to uh i i would say well over 95 percent of the the uh, the models predictions can be derived from just like those three to four okay. features so how about you know day of the game conditions like wind speed and direction is that good? figured in somehow that's an ongoing request uh and i'm we don't get great weather data it's a thing that vendors are are trying to tell us that they can provide now we so what we have is basically we get a, a, a description from nlb it says you know it was the winds were this strong the it was this uh, temperature uh but of course it's very different than getting it on the individual pitch and um, and then the conditions, it, it all depends on where you're reading those things as well. Like conditions inside the stadium can look very, people always say, you know, you can look at the flags in the outfield uh, and see which way the wind is blowing. But inside the stadium, it can feel very different. It could be, it could be swirling. And then there's also the, so like when you think about building that in and, and, um, and asking an outfielder to actually implement the, the strategy, it's, you know, that, they could like put their their finger up and try to read the wind. <laughs> it's like there's you know there there are limits to the amount of complexity, which is why we operate generally in 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 terms like take this many steps or um, you know here here are some rough guidelines as to how you can how you can react to these conditions. But yeah, I I have got the request of how can we make better use of weather data. You need to think about it, like in terms of like the sun. The sun direction can be important for whether or not it was able to see the ball. But throughout the game, the sun is moving and causing different shadows, and the may or may not be more visible. It depends on the structure of the stadium, like what's the angle, or where it's at. If they add a new feature, if they add some new lights for some reason that year, like it could end up being uh, hindering the sun in some different way. So it's a complex challenge to include like that level of granularity in some of those models, but. Something that's often requested as well. <laughs> you guys, if you're on the road, you get the same data that their team. I mean, are you using the cameras that other teams have or whatever? Yeah, they do? it's it was kind of the wild west for a while, um, where teams would purchase certain data sources and then uh, have some kind of sharing agreement with other teams. Uh, and MLB kind of stepped into. Um, to do a lot of that and say, if you're collecting these sources of data, they need to be shared. It used to be um, the hot strategy, was, like the Yankees purchased uh, a radar unit that they put in a junior college and they would 
like fly players to that junior college to do secret like pitching sessions <laughs> so that they could get data on those pitchers that nobody else had. And MLB stepped in and said, you can't do that anymore. So we, we generally get the same sources of data, although wait, we're for kinematic data, as an example, that's a thing we have to pay a lot for that some other teams don't want to pay for. And so they don't get access to our data. There's a certain set of vendors that are standardized across the league, and then we may purchase additional vendors that would be yeah. a smaller subset if any shared across teams. But in general, we have data from every game um, across levels as well. So the Dodgers, the OKC, our AAA team, all the way down to the DSL, we get data yeah. there as well. There's actually a proposal floating around right now among owners who don't want to spend money to put a cap on how much can be spent on front office staff and, and data sources as well, because they don't, they're, they're sick of hearing from their employees that we need an analytics department or we need this new data source. So their, their response is like, we just want a supercomputer in any I Well, it's, it's housed in rural Oregon somewhere is everything we do through AWS. Uh, yeah. It's, so big as you can. Yeah, we we I don't I don't know the biggest like the most we've asked of AWS, but we we've thrown some. You have a a legitimate use case and a reason, and can convince Richard and the people about <laughs> Richard that this is a, a need to in order to make better predictions and. It's yeah, it, we've on occasion spun up the the machine that costs twenty five dollars an hour, which is the highest highest tier of AWS. But then I had to sheepishly say, I, I promise I won't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll finish up here. Quick, then we can get some some more Q and A. Um, yeah, so like I said, we're we're constantly talking about uh, giving these information then to fielders, so they have something on the field to help them in terms of like where to align. And also to factor in things like hitter tendencies. This was like a good graphic that was shown during the 2021 NLDS. And so if you had information that showed uh, where this batter was most likely to hit a ball on the ground, it would be likely to only put one fielder over here in this 16% range and concentrate your fielders much more heavily on the right side, which is kind of what led uh, to the shift in the first place. Um, but it was now banned starting in 2023. So the furthest this player could go now would be right on the back, essentially where this umpire is standing now. Is, is that modified by adding to, you know, runners on the leads? Uh, yeah, right? that's definitely an important condition. Like the ability, you can think if there's uh, a runner on first, you still want to be able to turn a double play, which would be uh, making an out at second base first and then throwing to first base. Yeah. And by putting the fielders further away, uh, from that pivot position, you can, there's like a trade off that you have to be able to make as well. And so we, we try and quantify that too. Also to guard against the stolen base, right? they, we will generally have some constraints where there has to be a fielder who's able to get to second base if that runner on first base takes off. Otherwise, <laughs> if we don't have someone there, they're just going to do it. Take off. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we get, we get a lot of back and forth on constraints that we need to put in there's a time there are times where it might appear that the optimal center fielder position is standing directly behind the pitcher but then the center fielder will tell you well, i can't see the ball off the bat so like i so we have to put in restrictions that you need to be you know yeah off center by a certain amount so that they can read the ball off the bat yeah it's, it's a constant feedback too it's not just like we build the model and then we just we give them the results and then that's it uh, yeah. Part of the baseball strategy information team is iterating with coaches, with uh, front office staff, and helping us like improve or make changes to how we deliver the, the products. Uh, so what does this mean in terms of like implications instead of just on field strategy? We can also then now estimate player talent. Um, and this contributes, like I said earlier, to like a holistic view of the player. Uh, we can think about what is the minimum uh, batting talent needed for player X, given that his viewing talent is Z. You can think back to when Cody Bellinger, before he went to the Cubs and was good at hitting again, he was very bad at hitting <laughs> with us, uh, but he was very good at fielding that year. So there's this trade-off, uh, and we can kind of quantify that in terms of runs to see, is this a trade-off that we think is uh, net positive EV overall? Um, this was a very exciting play. I remember watching this one when he robbed uh, Tatis in the 2020 playoffs. What a home run. Um, 
And then we can also do things like, can we estimate uh, field ability at a, a different position, a position we've never seen you play before? If we have information about how uh, fielders' ability changes, uh, fielders who have moved around different positions, so someone going from left field to center field, we can estimate the average difference potentially overall, and then use that to project, let's say we moved uh, Cody Bellinger to left field instead of center field. How good we, would we expect him to be? And maybe there's some interesting things about Cody Bellinger that would make him above or below average. Um, so that's kind of a question we would often be faced with, with answering as well. So some data I'm not hearing at all is like the fans, popularity of players. Mm -hmm. Does that mean? <laughs> we, I get very, I got very upset with Cody Bellinger. Yeah, we don't often wade into things around uh, the popularity of players, although every time a, a popular player leaves, I know that our executives get at least some degree of grief from yeah. ticket sales. So like Justin Turner, uh, Cody Bellinger, two very popular players left this off season and, and ticket sales said, you know, you're killing us. People aren't renewing their season tickets. And of course the, the old adage is uh, people root for the laundry, right? Yeah. It's, it's put anyone in a Dodgers uniform and if the team is good, then, then they'll come watch it. Um, so I, I guess I, it, it does kind of, uh, okay. so I want to talk about some, what I would, if our moral issues in, in the work we do. Um, and some of it gets to kind of the enjoyability of baseball, which I think is a totally legitimate critique. Um, so I guess the first one is, I, I sometimes wonder if our attempt to find undervalued players are using data to find the guy who, who the league doesn't understand the value of, uh, is that just synonymous with trying to find players to underpay for the value of their labor? And that doesn't feel great, um, but but to a certain extent, there you could also I, I, I uh, soothe myself by saying there are also players who never would have gotten a chance if uh, if their talents were not identified. But I, I do kind of have to wrestle with that as uh, I don't know somebody considers himself generally pro labor. Um, so uh, the second point I think gets to your question about fan enjoyment, which is our our goal is. Um, our goal is to help play efficient baseball, right? So we want we want players who do things in a certain way. We want to maximize the number of outs we make on defense. We want to get the most strikeouts. And that's not necessarily enjoyable baseball. Um, we, you know, we're working within the, the constraints that the league places on us to try and again win the most games. Uh, but I think there's a good case that it's made the quality of the product worse. I think the, the league actually. Occasionally, a blind squirrel, you know, um, they they made the quality of the product better this year by implementing a pitch clock and then maybe incentivizing more stolen bases. Um, but yeah, we're we're kind of responding to the incentives that we're given, even if it's not necessarily good for baseball as a whole. Um, and then, oh, I guess yeah, I, the the plot on the right is. Um, it's the uh, the number of stolen base attempts over time, and I guess I should have added 2023. But one of the things that, that came out of early baseball analysis was that stolen bases are actually pretty inefficient plays. Uh, you have to be successful a lot more than you're unsuccessful in order for the risk to be worth it. And so teams stop stealing bases, but stolen bases are awesome. Stolen bases are fun, you know? Uh, so we, 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 people like us were responsible for helping to move stolen bases out of the game, which is bad. Um, now they're back. Um, and finally, I think we just have to be very careful about how we use data. Um, we can kind of unknowingly reinforce uh, biases, especially when we're informing decisions about how people get paid. Um, an example would be, um, I used to work in the, the amateur draft space and in the amateur draft you have, um, there's negotiating flexibility um, in terms of what a player is going to get paid. There's a suggestion, but ultimately you draft a player and then you come to an agreement and they can choose not to take it, go back to college or, or go back to school. Um, and so my, my supervisor, I think very reasonably asked, can we come up with a model for what it's going to take to sign a player? Because they want to know that. They want to cut out some of the BS in negotiations and just say, here's what we think this guy is going to take. Um, but when you think about the implications of that, um, what a player is willing to sign for is, is very closely tied to their background, right? It takes a lot of money to sign a player from South Orange County because they come from money, right? They, uh, they have a commitment to Stanford. 
And, and so when you think about like, okay, well, uh, if we use zip code, uh, you could come up with a better predictive model of what it would take to sign somebody, but with kind of um, ghoulish consequences. And, and so uh, fortunately in that case, we were able to say, we're not comfortable with that. This is a bad idea, but if you're not careful, you, um, you can do some pretty awful things with data. <clears throat> Oh yeah, I guess oh, yes. yeah, um, yeah. So I guess I, this is all just an extended recruiting pitch. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess some some general uh, questions that that we often get asked are these um, these are like how do people start working in baseball? And I think everyone's answer is a little bit different. Like we came yeah. straight from grad school. Mm -hmm. Some people do internships. Like some people come from industry. We've got two people who just joined us from JPL. Um, some people are super fans. Some people like don't, don't like baseball as much. They're at least <laughs> aware of baseball usually at a, at a bare minimum. But some people came from basketball, for instance, instead of baseball. Um, and it's not that you have to be the biggest fan <laughs> in order to enjoy or do the job. Um, if you enjoy problem solving, if you enjoy like uh, data science in general, there's a lot of resources that we have to do that, and a team of people that are like constantly thinking about that. Um, it helps to really like baseball. It, does. Like you, it, it, it helps to get some some non monetary benefit from going into the stadium every day, or a, <laughs> I do, you know winning the NL West, or you know then dealing with the consequences of losing in the divisional series. Um, so yeah, the I mean the career trajectories it's it's an interesting time because the the real explosion of baseball analytics jobs happened probably ten ish years ago. And so now people have grown and, and they're advancing into all kinds of different roles. Like there are three former members of the Dodgers uh, analytics department who have gone on to work as assistant general managers. And there are people from analytics backgrounds who are now serving as the chief executives of teams. And so that's a career trajectory that uh, I think would have seemed very unattainable for, you know, for the nerds uh, once upon a time, but it's, it's sort of the wild west. Like we, we have, career tracks for people to just be individual contributors and be really good statisticians who want to work on difficult problems. Um, but yeah, it's, you can use data science, you can use statistics as an entry into baseball and kind of go anywhere at this point. So I've got a question. Yeah. So do hot streaks really exist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I so I my um, my political answer to this. I so I think hot streaks I do think they exist. I think our ability to detect them is very, very poor. So like, if we think about a hot streak as some, um, some short-term like, real improvement in performance, um, I, I think that happens. I think that the amount of uh, observation to observation variation just absolutely swamps the um the change in player talent so for every for every player that we observe on a hot streak some of them are hot and i think the vast majority of them are not hot in a way that carries any kind of predictive power so i kind of throw my hands up and say there, there's too much noise to to get at that question now i think the the actual answer to that would be we need we need better data if we want to detect it. Like if, if a hot streak for a pitcher is being able to repeat something mechanically, like that, we actually don't need a lot of data to detect. Like is a pitcher repeating something over and over again, as opposed to is a pitcher giving up home runs, right? Home runs are very noisy, mechanics are not. So uh, based on the data I have, I just totally punted. Based on the data we've had, I don't think we could ever detect them, but I think there's an opportunity to. I think it's more plausible for pitchers than batters. Well, then what happened in the playoffs? We, so I, I was talking with someone earlier. Um, you know, the thing we have to deal with is that our ability to predict outcomes of a baseball game is, is objectively pretty poor. You know, we're, we're, we're dealing with, uh, with small R squares. You know, um, we could do better than, than a person who's not using any data, uh, but the amount of randomness at the individual plate appearance level or the game level is so high. So it's, it, 
we don't know why we didn't play well in the playoff. And I, I promise you, we have spent a lot of front office hours trying <laughs> to chase down every theory that anyone has written in a comment section on the internet. Like we've, we've tried to chase it down and see if we can figure it out because we, uh, it, it is now three years in a row that we have been knocked out by a team that we were better than. Uh, in expectation, our true talent is is better. We can inform that most directly with our techniques, with our models. And then often what happens in the game is a bunch of random events that have varying degrees of noise and signal. And so we control as much as we can in expectation. And then life happens and we get sad. Is there any data on how many times Robert's actually did the game? Uh, we actually not Roberts. Um, we do have we do track where our fielders are positioned, and we we provide audits. We have recommendations about say like pitch types, and we we do audits on those. And um, so, and the coaching staff is very open to it. They they appreciate the feedback. Sometimes they disagree, and that's a thing that's totally in their control. We're not managing from the the front office. Like Dave is very much his own person. One more issue. Yeah. What about sports betting? <laughs> Where, what, what do you do? You can go Um, there, there are definitely people who have gone into the betting space. It, like, frankly, it probably pays better. Um, and it's new and exciting. I personally think it's kind of gross, and I, I, I don't like watching sports media and seeing nonstop betting information in my face. Like, I don't, I don't engage with. With sports like that, um, I also don't. Uh, I don't know. I, a couple of years ago, during, during COVID, I decided I was going to try to put together a football betting model. I probably sunk thirty hours into it, and it wasn't any good. And so I just threw my hands up. So now I'm out of the betting space. <laughs> I'm just wondering, do you have evidence that teams that put more uh, resources into analytics have better records, uh, or is it a Bias thing where those teams that have more money get better players and they're putting more money in the analytics. I mean, yeah. you know, it's hard to know which comes first. Yeah, I, I think that there is pretty convincing evidence, I would say, of it being a long term successful strategy of teams. You can look at a handful of teams that uh, have large analytics departments but spend fewer resources in general, like the Indians, the Rays, the Guardians. Sorry, excuse me, thank you, the Guardians. The Guardians and the Rays, uh, who have large analytics departments and have really invested them as a resource and have found a lot of success. Um, there's obviously teams like the Dodgers that have uh, large analytics and a large amount of resources in terms of what we're willing to spend. Um, and that maybe keeps us successful for longer cycles. Um, but I think uh, a necessary condition to be successful is to be able to quantify and make good predictions. And you only do that through, or I think one of the most useful ways to do that is through the analytics department. There's traditional scouting as well. It's aimed at doing the same thing. And it's best when they're like, have some sort of synergy. Um, yeah, so- I, let's see, yeah, we, let's just go to q &A. Exactly. I don't think we have anything else uh, yeah. other than you can uh, there. Yeah, here, here's our, our contact information. We're actually opening a recruiting cycle. If there are people here or people you know who are interested in sports as a career, this could be undergrads, this could be grad students, this could be people who are students of yours years ago. But please take our contact information. We're always looking for smart, like good, talented statisticians uh, to join our team. And do you have, do you have internships? Uh, we do have internships. Yeah, we're going to post one in... Uh, month or so, but I would say just send it, like, you send some of my contact info, uh, and, and I'm more than willing to take some time to, to answer questions over email for them. Right, any immediate questions? I, I just would ask more questions. Yeah, somebody would advise the students. Yeah. Um, what, what level of people are you interested in? Like people with master's degrees, undergrads, PhDs? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the size of your team and how many teams have analytic groups. I just want to understand the, the size of the population of the employment opportunity. Yeah, so within our team of quantitative analytics, there's nine to 10 of us. There's probably three to four people that came from straight from undergrad. Uh, the rest would be graduate school, usually like PhD or MS background. Um, in terms of the positions we're, we're hiring for, it's uh, at any level, if it's a good candidate and a good fit. 
Uh, and then the number of positions will vary by, by team as well. Um, how many opening jobs there are for, for each level. Uh, and then there's also, uh, depending on your background, like there could be the systems side if you're much more into like web development or computer science, or there's performance science if you have a biomechanical background. Um, that should be everything else. Yeah, as uh, Justin said it well, we're, they, obviously we have different standards. We apply for candidates at different levels, but we love to get students who, uh, we index really heavily on students with research experience. I'd love to see a good undergraduate project advised by a professor uh, on an undergraduate resume, because it tells me that they've had to deal with, I, I really, research is difficult. It's, it's, um, yeah, they've had they've had to deal with the vagaries of collecting data and then dealing with uh, with with bad data and um, so yeah, anyone who's who's coming from that background and has a, a good like plausible statistics background is they're a very attractive candidate for us. Okay, with that in time, we'll thank our speakers. Thank you very much. We're around for a short time, just so people have additional questions. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool.